We have a drama, and then we're going to show a, a short video presentation, and then we're going to cut into worship tonight, okay? So if you will, go ahead and find you a seat, find you a seat, because it's going to be a few minutes before we get started with the worship anyway, okay? You guys are just so good. Y'all having a wonderful time? More importantly, is the Lord changing your life? That's what I want to know. I want you to give it up for JV as they perform the drama called Please. Give it up for them tonight. Christy, I called you in my office because you're failing my class. But Miss Smith, your gradebook says I have a C. Christy, you've missed 12 days already, and you know you're only allowed to miss seven. But Miss Smith, please, I'll make it up. I'm really sorry. Christy, there's nothing I can do. You're going to fail my class. But Miss Smith, I have to graduate. You're going to fail my class because you're nothing but a failure. What? How can I graduate? Christy, you know the date we had planned for Friday night? Yeah, Ryan, I'm really looking forward to that. Well, you can cancel it. Why, Ryan? Christy, you've changed. You've got problems, and I don't want to be a part of them. But, Ryan, we had plans for college. Those were your plans, Christy. Please, Ryan. I don't love you anymore. What? What did I do? Christy, Nicole, where were you last night? Look, Mom, I can explain. You were out drinking with your no good friends again, weren't you? No, Mom, I just spent some time alone. Don't you give me that. Don't you lie to me. Look, Mom, just get off my back, okay? I will not get off your back, Christy Nicole. As long as you live under my roof, you'll abide by my rules. Look, Mom, I'm sorry. I didn't need your father or your sister, and I don't need you! What? I'm not gonna get to graduate. Ryan dumps me, and now Mom kicks me out of the house. I have no one. I'll call Melissa. Hey, Christy. Melissa, I really need to talk to you. Look, make it quick. Dad and I have somewhere to be in 10 minutes. But Melissa, Mom kicked me out of the house! I don't understand why you're calling me with your problems, Christy. There's nothing I can do. But Melissa, please, I have nowhere else to go. Just let me talk to Dad. No, Christy, Dad and I have a good relationship now. We don't need you to come along and ruin it. But I have nowhere else to go. We don't have time for you. What? My friends and family abandoned me, and I'm not going to get to graduate? Doesn't anybody care? Christy, I've called you into my office because you're failing my class. Christy, you know You've the day we had plans for Friday night? Well, you can cancel it. Those are your plans, Christy. Christy, you're not tricking me. No, please. 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 Somebody will miss me. Please. Chrissy was a problem child. She had problems at home and problems at school. But it wasn't my fault. There was nothing I could have done. Christy had all these ideas and plans for us. She was always assuming I wanted to go along with them. It's not my fault. There's nothing I could have done. Christy, I should have listened. I should have cared. But she chose mom in the divorce, not dad. Mom should have listened and mom should have cared. It's not my fault. Oh, God. Oh, Christy. What have I done? How could I have let this happen to my baby? Oh, I shouldn't have let myself get so bitter over the divorce. I should have told you about Jesus. Oh, God, please. Young people, I want to encourage you to remember that most of your friends are hurting and they need you to tell them about Jesus. It's up to us to deliver the hope and the message of salvation. The teenagers that you have been watching perform this week are part of our JV program. These young people, uh, that's okay. These young people um, have given 
their summer to the Lord. Many of them had jobs, and they quit their jobs in order to be a part of an intense program that's built off of another program that you may have heard of before called Master's Commission. And uh, this, these are all teenagers. Most of them are in high school. They quit their summer jobs, and they're giving their life to Jesus during eight weeks during the summer. During that eight weeks, they're memorizing 100 memory verses. They're taking six hours of college courses. They're working 60 hours a week at the church. And uh, they're, they're learning a lot about practical ministry, and they're just giving their life to Jesus. And I'll be honest with you, it's a pilot program about a, um, that's getting us ready for a program that we're starting at, at Brownsville in just a couple of months. We're hoping to start in November. We're wanting to start our own Master's Commission program at Brownsville in November. And I want you to direct your attention to the screen. We have a, a video presentation that we want to give, uh, let you see at this time, if you will. Give your attention to the video screen. you're doing 
You're getting in line for masters, aren't you? Now, <laughs> if you're interested, if you're interested in more information about the Master's Commission program that we're starting in November, there's going to be a booth set up on the second level over here at this doorway, and you can pick up information tomorrow about the Master's program. We are going to be limiting it to 20 individuals. So you can pick up an application there if you're interested. Now, you ready to worship the Lord, aren't you? Give Jesus a hand tonight. Come on. Hallelujah.
strength I do endure. By his power I've been lifted. In his love I am secure. Cause he bought me with the price. Freed me from the pit. Filled with emptiness and wrath. And a fire that burns in it. I was saved by the blood of the Lamb. Saved by the blood of the Lamb. Come on, lift up your voice. Sing. Saved I'm serving and I'm so glad, so glad, so glad, so glad. Come on, lift up your voice. Thank you, Lord. to dare. I'm going down for the last time, but by his mercy I've been spared. Not by works, by faith in him who called. For so long I've been hindered. For so long I've been stalled. I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. Saved by the blood of the Lamb. Come on, look up your voice. Saved I'm so glad, I'm so glad, so glad, so glad, so glad. I'm going down for the last time, but by his mercy I've been spared. Not by works, by faith in him who called. For so long I've been hindered, for so long I've been starved. I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. Saved by the blood of the Lamb. Come on, lift up your voice. Saved. I'm so glad, I'm so glad, so glad, so glad, so glad. Come on, lift up your hands and sing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Lord. 
Come on, give the Lord praise. Praise you in the morning, praise you in the evening, praise you when I'm young and when I'm old. Praise you when I'm laughing, praise you when I'm grieving, praise you every season of the sun. I praise you in the morning, praise you in the evening, praise you when I'm young and when I'm old. I praise you when I'm laughing, praise you when I'm grieving, praise you every season of the sun. If they could see how much you're worth, your power, your might, your endless love, the surely they will never cease to pray. Forever and a day. I praise you on the earth now, joining with creation, calling all the nations to your praise. If they could see how much your worth, your power, your might, your endless love, the surely they will never cease.
Come on, lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. the perfect time to be free before the Lord.
Is it true today that when people pray, cloudless skies will break, kings and queens will shake? Yes, it's true.
is all about you, Lord.
I'm hear you sing. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. You are worthy. sing. your voices. Oh, yeah. There's a sweet sound in the ears of God. <laughs> He's holy. There's a sweet sound in the ears of God. He's holy.
want you to lift your voice. Come on, sing it out. Jesus, we love you tonight. Lift your hands before the Lord for a moment, young people. Just lift your hands and begin just to express in your own way your love to Jesus. Father, we love you. Lord, we give you all praise and glory and honor. We thank you for the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we give you the praise that you deserve. The psalmist said, great is the Lord, and because the Lord is great, he greatly deserves my praise. And Lord, we, we recognize your greatness in this place tonight, Jesus. And we give you the praise and the glory. We give you all the honor. Lord, let's do what you your most marvelous and precious Lord. Jesus, hear the praise of this generation. Praise the Lord. Mike, if you will, just continue to worship the Lord as the young people begin to make their way back to their seat tonight. Praise you, Lord. If you will, just make your way back to your seat. When you get there, just remain standing. Just remain standing for just a moment. Tonight at the conclusion of the service, we want to have plenty of time to pray for everybody that wants to be prayed for. And so I want to release Steve tonight as quickly as possible. We'll give you just a moment to get to your seat, though. Mike, just stay where you are just for a moment, please. Haven't you enjoyed the spirit that's been in this conference? Thank you, Jesus. You know what impresses me more than your worship? Listen to me, young people. You know what impresses me more than your worship? Is your cooperative spirit and your attentive spirit during the preaching of the word. I love preaching to people like you. I really do. Because let me tell you something. Anybody can get excited about a little bit of music. But you know what? When the music stops, the attitudes 
that I see in this place is the type of attitudes that I like to see. Your cooperative spirit, your attitude. And not only that, but whenever there's the preaching of the word, you're open to the, what the Spirit of the Lord has to say, and that says a lot about you tonight. And so I just want you to know I love you and appreciate you so much for that. Listen to me. I'm not going to give I'm not going to give a big long introduction for Steve. First of all, Steve wouldn't like for me to do that. But let me just say this. See, you know Steve Hill as evangelist, possibly one of the greatest evangelists that have ever graced the grounds of America. But it's fine. It's okay to give honor where honors do. But listen, you know him as evangelist. But see, I have an, a, a tremendous privilege and honor to know him as friend. My wife will tell you that should I die before Jesus comes, I want her to put on my tombstone this phrase, those that knew him best loved him most. Because, see, I know how we are in the Christian world, teenagers. Um, it's real easy for us, if we have just a little bit of talent or gift or charisma, it's easy for us to go into an arena like this and, and fly in an airplane to some place in America or into another nation and woo a crowd, and the whole crowd goes, whoa, what a man of God. But how many of you realize that just because God anoints you and uses you in ministry, it does not mean that his stamp of approval is on your lifestyle. Hello. See, see, God used a donkey to prophesy, but it didn't mean that he was approving of the donkey's lifestyle. And young people never make the mistake. Listen to me carefully. Because many of you, God is going to use you in ministry, maybe to give a prophecy or to preach or to sing or something of that nature. And if you're not careful, you'll make the mistake that most of us make, and that is this. When God begins to use you, all of a sudden you'll become, you'll begin to think that God's favor is upon you and that he is pleased with you and pleased with your lifestyle. That's not necessarily true. You do not judge your spirituality by the gifts that God so graciously gives to you. You judge your spirituality by the fruit of the Spirit and your personal walk with God. And I tell my staff and I tell my young people this all the time. Your level of public ministry will be equivalent to your level of private ministry. And, and, and I just want to kind of drop that in your spirit tonight as a lesson for you to chew on and let it sink deep in your spirit because many of you will be tripped up by the devil because he will, he will actually create opportunities for you to apparently be used by God in a powerful way and you'll fall to pride and stumble and so forth. See, the reason why I wanted Steve to come and address you tonight is not because he's the evangelist of Brownsville Assembly and that's the... Uh, the thing to do. But let me tell you something. You know him as Steve Hill, the evangelist. I know him as friend. And just as I was saying a while ago, it's easy to go and impress a crowd. The people I want to impress the most is not you. The people I want to impress the most is my wife and my children. If I was to die, I want my children to stand at my graveside and to say these words, if there was ever a man of God, it was my daddy that's laying in the grave right now. That's my number one goal in life. And, and the thing I love about Steve Hill is this. I talk to Steve Hill all the time behind closed doors. And Steve Hill, in my opinion, is a greater man of God behind closed doors than he is in the pulpit. And there's not a man on the face of the earth today that I respect and admire and appreciate more than Steve Hill. And I'm so honored and glad to be able to introduce you, him to you tonight. So would you let my friend, Steve Hill, be welcome tonight. Would you give it up for him? Glory. Hallelujah.
Remain standing just for a minute. God's in the house. God's in the house. We bless you, Lord. Before we're seated, we're going to ask the Lord to speak to us and to change our lives. I don't take this meeting lightly. Let me just share with you before we pray. There is such a hunger in the land right now. We, um, this is just fresh on my heart. I need to share this. For those of you that are wondering what's going on in America, what kind of hunger is out there, I know that um, the revival at Brownsville has received a lot of attention, and we'll take it or leave it, but we can't deny the fact that, that major media has come through, and it shows me the hunger that's in the land. Many of you are probably familiar with the fact, or maybe you're not, that the revival was um, written about in Spin Magazine. This is, uh, how many are familiar with Spin? Good, you're not. A couple of you are. But Spin is, um, is a secular uh, magazine, and um, it's, you know, full of just, just stuff. And um, it's the youth culture music magazine. Manson will advertise in here. Anybody that's doing anything in the secular world advertises in here. And I'm not going to go through this, but I wanted to share this with the youth here. Because um, you would wonder why Spin Magazine would come to Brownsville. How many would wonder that? I would wonder that. I wondered that. And when they came, they, um, they stayed for five days. And I don't, I'm not going to go through the story tonight, but I, when we, got, we bought the magazine at a local um, music store uh, a few weeks after the Spin came, and the article is entitled, An Awesome God. And in it, now I want you to understand the same folks, Marilyn Manson's reading this, okay, because his picture's in it and all. The, the same folks that are reading this, you know, it's, it's a, they, they're, reading, they're reading stories about local concerts, reading stories about new CDs and new releases, music projects, bands coming in from Europe and all. And then they read, if the Brownsville Assembly brings America back to God, it will come on its knees scared sinless. And, um, and then there's, there's stories about punk rockers getting right with God. It's incredible. And then I'm just sharing a couple things with you. Then, then Cheryl Crow comes out with a song, and, and she says, she writes, and uh, this is one of her CDs. She, she says, I went down to Pensacola to that revival. She said, those holy rollers don't know nothing about my soul. And, and uh, this is interesting to me that a secular artist would take the time to even write a song and talk about coming to the Brownsville Revival. You want to know why they're doing this, friend? Because there is a hunger in the land. People are hungry. I would say, if it didn't mean anything to you, why did you write about it? If... <laughs> Maybe we do so know something about our soul. But um, it's, uh, it's very interesting that um, we, we just went on the air uh, with, in a secular network on Sunday night with a revival special. Most of you were here. Some of you may have seen it. You may have been in travel, maybe saw it in a hotel room. But um, anybody see that? Now, we're just now getting the figures back on this, but I want you to understand, so I want you to hear me. Secular networks, okay? I want you to. I want you to. I want you to feel what we're feeling. I just shared this with Richard. That um, a normal response on anything like that is everyone listening. I'm talking about Joe Blow sitting out there drinking a beer, watching the special. Okay, a normal response. You just get a handful of phone calls, people calling and stuff like that. But a normal uh, response of, of of calls that you can't get to. And, and if it's an incredible program and you can't get to the calls, would be like 5,000 because the phone banks, they can tell AT&T and Sprint can tell when people called and couldn't get, couldn't get through. And I'm talking about Sunday night when we ran a special on secular television. Today we've got a phone call from the phone banks and, uh, they, with AT&T and Sprint and found out that over, is anyone listening? 
over 50,000 people could not get in. 50,000. 50,000 people tried to call and couldn't get through, and it shut down AT&T, shut down Sprint. They couldn't get the, they could There is a hunger in the land for truth. People are hungry. People want to know the truth. And we're not talking, I'm not talking tonight about some flim-flam, cheesy Christian programming. We're talking about hardcore gospel. Amen. So there's a hunger in the land. Keep on keeping on. Right now, I want everyone to pray with me. We're going to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts and to change our lives. God's got a message for you tonight. I don't take this lightly. I don't take this lightly. This is so, I love Richard Crisco. I love the work here. And youth pastors and leaders, I want all the youth pastors and leaders to raise their hand. Youth pastors and leaders, I love you, man. I love you. My wife and I have been where you're at, and, and our, when our youth group started growing and from you know 20 to 40 to 60 to 80 to 100 to 200, and I saw these kids coming in and coming in, coming in from everywhere, I knew that the youth were the answer to America. You are. God bless everyone for coming to this thing. I want everyone to pray. I want everyone to pray with me right now, everyone out loud, everyone whether you love God or not, whether you're here for God or you're here for a girl, whatever the reason you came, I want you to pray with me right now. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart. speak to my heart, change my life, change my life. In, your name, in your precious name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Okay? In just a few minutes, we're going to be turning all the lights out, so please stay seated. Don't move around. I know that this is a divine appointment. How many have never been to the Brownsville Revival? Lift your hand. Wow. We welcome you. When we do the Awake Americas around the nation, and uh, how many have been to Awake America? Lift your hand. How many... How many have not been to an Awake America? Lift your hand. The majority of the people. Well, we welcome you. Tonight I'm going to share with you something that is going to happen. It's going to happen to every single person within the sound of my voice. Those of you that are watching this at home, it's going to happen to you. Every single person is going to experience what I'm talking about tonight. You don't have to believe it. It's still going to happen. I want you to turn, if you've got a Bible, turn with me to 2 Timothy. Hey. I said, if you've got a Bible. You're not going to let them out, do you now? Hey, if you've got a Bible. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy, New Testament youth leaders, 2 Timothy, <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 4, is my tie straight? 2 <laughs> Timothy chapter 4. Verse 6, a familiar scripture to those of us that are in the church. For I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Verse 8, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, Paul said, but unto all them, say all. all, say it again, all. all, but unto all them also that love his appearing. How many are going to love his appearing? All. One more scripture in the book of Revelation. Turn with me a few more pages to your right. Revelation. 
And as we turned to Revelation, everyone said, Ooh. Lions and tigers and bears. You watch too much TV. <laughs> Revelation 3.11. Behold, this is Jesus speaking. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Friend, you have no idea how powerful this is and how powerful the next few minutes are going to be for you. You have no clue. Now, I'm going to use this night as a memorial again for a handful of martyrs that have gone on to be with the Lord this year. Many of you may have attended services already, maybe in Colorado, maybe in other places. Maybe you would acquire the fire up in Michigan. I don't know. But um, there are about five young ladies. Cassie Bernal is one of them. Rachel Scott is another. These young girls, that, you know what's sad about martyrdom? What's sad about this America? Some of you have allowed what happened in Columbine already to pass. It only happened a couple months ago, but it's already old news for you. It's so sick, friend. It's so sad. These three girls right here, this is old news. This happened months ago. Nicole, Jessica, and Casey... Paducah, Kentucky, remember the shooting in the hallways? They're at a morning prayer meeting. If somehow we could call in Cassie and Rachel and these other girls to visit us tonight, they would stand behind me with tears in their eyes and they'd be praying and they'd say, Jesus, don't let one human being within the sound of Steve's voice be distracted tonight. Jesus, that they would listen to every word that's said because we have experienced what Steve is going to talk about tonight. This is entitled, You Can't Have It. You Can't Have It. My object, my center of interest tonight has to do with the crown. The crown. Jesus said, say Jesus said, let no one take your crown. Now we're going to talk about that for a few minutes and I've got a lot of notes. I'm not going to use all my notes. I'm going to use some of them tonight. I want to speak from my heart to your heart. I want you to, how many will listen tonight? But we're going to talk about a crown. And trust me, friend, every one of you within the sound of my voice, if you don't listen, one day you're going to wish you had. You're going to wish you had listened to this Wednesday night message. Jeannie Mayo was with you last night. Richard was with you night before. You've got other stuff going on the week. But friend, all we have right now is Wednesday. All we have right now is 8.30 at night, right here in the Coliseum in Pensacola. All you have is the breath in you right now. That's all you have. Listen to what God is speaking to you about. Pay attention. Don't let anyone distract you. And friend, don't distract anybody. It doesn't matter what you're going to eat after the service. If you've got to go to the bathroom, just slip out and go. Don't tell half the row. Quit distracting people. But the word crown is found throughout the Bible, and I'm not going to give all the scriptures. You can look it up later. But the word crown signifies royalty. It signifies honor. It signifies dignity. And it also signifies throughout the scripture as something of triumph. It is a reward for something that you did. If you're taking notes, that's what you need to write down about a crown. Not only royalty, but reward. All through the test, Old Testament, you'll find the crown mentioned. You know the story of Jesus. Why did they put a crown of thorns on his head? Why did they do that? 
Why was it a crown? Why did they weave thorns into a crown? Why? Because they were mocking the fact that he said who he said he was. They were mocking that. So they said, oh, you're a king? Here, here's one of our crowns. That's why they did what they did, because they knew that was a sign of mockery if they could take a homemade crown of thorns and stick it on his head. And they slapped him, and they whipped him, and they said, who did that, Jesus? You're so smart. You're so sharp. You're the king of the Jews. Talk to us. Paul talked about the crown of righteousness that I just read a few minutes ago. The Revelation 2.10 says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. The Bible talks about the incorruptible crown in 1 Corinthians 9.25. It talks about the crown of glory in 1 Peter 5.4. In Revelation 4.10, it talks about the 24 elders casting down their crowns before the Lord. Friend, I want to tell you, what I'm speaking on tonight is more important than you'll ever know. Every one of us are going to stand before God. And I promise you, friend, Scripture will come alive before your very eyes. You're going to wish you had listened to Wednesday night. You're going to wish you had listened, friend. The bottom line it's the crown is something, it's an item that you need to begin thinking about. Pro, pro, one of the problems with being young is we have this concept of, of life just going on forever and ever. And you think nothing's ever going to happen to you and with the life the way it is right now, if, if the Lord tarries his coming, there's a good chance that many of us in this room will live to 110 the way science and medicine is moving forward. But the bottom line is, everyone in this room is going to die. And everyone's going to face what I'm talking about. Cassie may have said a week before her death, I'm young, I've got all my life ahead of me, I'm going to be this. Rachel was going to be an African missionary. Little did she know, within a week she was going to be a martyr. Nobody knows, so I'm going to talk about a crown. How many will allow me to do this tonight? Now, in just a few, a few months, they're going to be, we're going to be starting the, uh, the Olympic Games in, I believe it's in Australia. And right now, you're going to find athletes training, not only in Australia, but in other places that have the same type climate. They're going to be practicing, and they're after one thing, friend. They're after that treasure at the end. They're after the gold medal, the silver medal, the bronze medal. They're after that prize. Well, if you went back several thousand years, two or three thousand years, they weren't after gold and silver medals. They were after a crown. And oftentimes, it was just a wreath of leaves that they would place on the athlete's head. But when you stood before the crowd in Rome and they placed that wreath on your head, you were somebody. You had reached the pinnacle. You were honored with the government. You were honored among the people. Friend, I want you to hear me tonight when you hear me say crown. I am referring to the final outcome of our lives. The prize or the reward for everything you did for Jesus. Now, some of us in this room are pitiful. You don't, do, you don't do a thing for Jesus. You could care less about Jesus. You could care less about the kingdom. You could care less about God. Everything you do has to do with self, 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 self. What can I get for me? What can I buy for me? A person could be starving next door, but all you want is to head down to the Gap store and get a new pair of blue jeans. You don't care if they don't have no beans and rice. You don't care if they don't have food on the table. You're after yourself. There's people like that within the sound of my voice, and tonight you're going to change. There are others here. You have a passion for people. You love people. You care about your classmates. You come to me. You come to Richard. You come to Donnie. And you get on your knees. You come to your youth pastor. And you just weep tears over your lost friends that are at school. See, I'm a weeper. I break. When I hear about all these people that couldn't get through on the phone lines, man, I'm just tore up. And they're calling our office. Richard, we're getting calls, just flooded with calls. People getting saved. I mean, it's just phenomenal. And we, our staff, they just cry. They just cry. They just they'll cry over the telephone as someone else is getting saved. Why? That's our passion. That's all that matters to us. Well, let's back up a little bit here, friend. At the end of every life, there is a time of reward or punishment. How many believe that? 
I said at the end of every life, there is a time of reward or punishment. How many would rather have a reward? I'm going to tell you how to get it tonight. An athlete. The whole purpose behind athletics is to be the very best you can, very best you can be at that particular sport. And athletes will go through all kinds of rigorous training and rules. I want, to say, I want you to say rules with me. Rules. If you've ever been a diver, a platform diver, and you've entered into competition, you'll learn that a dive is scored between zero and 10 points in full or half point increments by a judge. Zero means completely failed. One half to two means unsatisfactory. Two and a half to four and a half means deficient. Five to six means satisfactory. Six and a half to eight means good. Eight and a half to 10 means very good. They will judge you on the approach, on the takeoff, on the elevation, on the execution, and the entry. You ever been watch? Have you ever watched? How many have watched diving before? What's your favorite part? Entry is my favorite part. I want to see how big the splash was. They, the judges judge you, and when that diver gets on that board, and he's got his speedos on, and he's ready to head to the end, friend, he's thinking one thing. I am being judged for every step, every move of my muscles. They are watching everything I do. And he knows if he steps off wrong, if he turns around on the diving board wrong, if he flips wrong, if he splashes too hard in the water, then he's being marked for that. Well, friend, it's the same in the spiritual realm. God watches everything you do. He's given us a rule book. It's called the Holy Bible. And he says, this is how you're supposed to live. And you better live it or you're going to pay the consequences. Friend, I don't want to get to heaven and be rated six and a half. I want to get to heaven and God say, perfect 10, perfect 10. There's other, I'm, Donnie, you were an athlete, weren't you? Well, you still are probably, but what were you, uh, what were you famed for? I mean, what, what was your big thing? Pole vaulting. Stand up, brother. How many like to see Donnie pole vault over this group of people right here? We would do it, but we don't have the pole. So we don't have the pole. Anybody got a pole? I didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but let me ask you something with pole vaulting what are some of the things they judged you on uh, your main thing is the height that you clear uh, the thing that makes it right is your approach um, the bend of the pole your, um, your form going overneath your push off y'all listening you could, you, could, you could grab a pole and go yeah, I'm going to jump over that right I'm going to jump over those buses you know? And Donnie would sit there and go, you're nuts. You'll never make it. I will too. I'm going to pick up all kinds of speed. You just watch. And he said, have you thought about pole placement? What's pole placement? Have you thought about this, thought about that? I don't know what you're talking about, friend. People are like that in the spirit realm. They go after God. They think they're going after God. They do what's right in their own eyes. They do what's right in their own mind. Friend, don't trust your own understanding. Read the book. You're going to be judged for what's in this book. This is the rule book. This is what you're going to be judged by. When people come up to me, one of the heartaches of ministry is young couples that get, they want to come up and get married, okay? I love her. I love her. Pastor Steve, I love her. Billy, oh, I love her. And they just, they're just, you know, slobbering over each other. And I, I sit there and I go, I go, Billy, listen, you know, you've known the Lord 16 years, you know, and, and she's known the Lord six days, you know. This is, you know. You know, she's 47, you're 18, there's just, I just feel something here, you know. Don't you see it? Oh, we don't see it. We're in love. We're in love. I just love her. I love her. And, you know, she still drinks, she still smokes or whatever, and you can see it's unequally yoked. With a, you don't have to pray about that, friend. It's in the Word. The Bible says not to be unequally yoked. And the person needs to grow in God. They need to get to a place where they're spiritually strong. And friend, I want to tell you something. This business of I'll get him saved later on. Hang it up. I hope you listen to Richard's session on dating. How many listen? <laughs> Listening is one thing. 
We will see. I can see you now, school cranks back up. There she is. And you... Your big Richard face appears before you. Hey, let me tell you something. Where's my wife at? Jerry, where are you at? Wave at me, baby. Holler at me. Hey, baby! There's my wife. We've been married 20 years longer than most of you have been alive. Moving right along. But let me tell you, when we went to school, we went to David Wilkerson's school, there was a rule there where you couldn't date, okay? And um, there was no, you could not fall in love. That was like a rule, okay? And, and so, um, but you think, you're, you got it tough. There was rules for everything. So we fell in love, and, and they knew it was God, so they set some serious rules. Some of you couldn't handle a minor rule. These were major rules. This, imagine being in love with somebody, and uh, we're not... 15 years old. We're like in our 20s, okay? We're in love, and we both lived a wild lifestyle before, and now we're falling under the, you know, the rules and commands of God and, and, and authority. Say authority. authority. Say it again. Authority. Doesn't that sound good? Authority. <laughs> we're falling under this authority, and they say to us, you guys are in love. We know you're in love. We know we love each other. You love each other. You cannot touch one another. You cannot hold hands. You cannot kiss. You can see each other 15 minutes a week. So we go, okay, we'll see each other. Boy, 15 minutes, friend. So you get it all in, 15 minutes, you know. Then, then they watch you to see how well you behaved, and then they give you 30 minutes a week. And then after that, they let us go to church and sit together during a church service. And then, so finally, I haven't kissed this girl. I haven't held her hand, but I know I want to marry her because I love her. I don't, I don't, I don't lust her. I love her. And so it comes time for marriage, time to ask her to marry me. And we, there's, we're out on a 400-acre ranch, and, and there's some, uh, I looked for the most perfect setting because we couldn't date, you know. And, and so there's these cattle, you know, these cows with a barn behind it. It was scenic, these cows, these heifers. And so we're walking along the road. There's not much time I need to pop the question. So in front of about 10 cows, I look at, I look at Jerry and I say, I love you. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> Would you marry me? How can I say no? <laughs> you will? Yes, I'll be your wife. Thank you. You're welcome. We couldn't shake hands. You know, normally you'd think, you know, you'd go, well, this is going to be cool down the road, you know. <laughs> but there was... <laughs> so I said... Wow, this is great. See you later. And I walked off and she walks off. Hey. So if you went to this rules and regulations dating type of thing, you need to take it to heart, friend, and let God develop in you a Christ-like spirit. When it's time for you to get married, you'll marry the right one. You don't want to marry the wrong one, friend. You hear me? Oh, we got to move here. But you're going to be judged at the end of the earth, at the end of your life, or you're going to be rewarded. My next point is this. In order for someone to be able to take your crown, Jesus said, be careful. Someone's out to take your crown. In order for someone to take your crown, you've got to first have one. Some of you don't have a crown. You don't have Zippo in heaven. Nada. Nada. Gloria a Dios. Bendito sea tu nombre. Alguien que habla español. De donde son? 
Bienvenidos! Friend, a thief cannot come into your house and steal something that you don't have. Someone can't take a crown if you don't have one. In order for someone to steal it, you got to first have something stored up in heaven. What are you doing for God? Do you know the Lord? In order to put on a crown up there, you must first put on a crown down here, on a cross down here. In order to get a glimpse of the crown up there, you must first get a grip on the cross down here. In order to be coronated when you die, you have to be crucified here on earth. That means you need to come to Jesus. Listen to me tonight. One of the reasons so many thousands of people respond to this ministry is because we don't play games. You're going to be a Christian, be a Christian. You want to be a heathen, go be a heathen. Get in or get out. You're going to be a Christian, get the sin out of your life. You're going to ask Jesus Christ to come in your life. Once you do that, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things pass away. Behold, all things are become new. Once you become a Christian friend, you change. That means a thief quits stealing. A liar quits lying. A homosexual quits homosexually. A drug addict quits doing drugs. An alcoholic quits drinking. An adulterer quits adulterating. When you give your life to Jesus, you change. Tonight, if you don't know the Lord, I want to remind you that Jesus Christ died on Calvary 2,000 years ago for you. He shed his blood for you. Buddha didn't die for you. Your pastor didn't die for you. Your youth pastor didn't die for you. Jesus died for you 2,000 years ago. And let me tell you something else. DC Talk didn't die for you. The Newsboys didn't die for you. Carmen didn't die for you. No one else died for you. Jesus died for you. He's the one that you need to bow down to. He's the one that you need to give honor and homage. He's the one you need to worship. He's the one you need to glorify. He's the one you need to lift up. It's all Jesus. It's all Jesus. It's all Jesus. He's all that matters. I love every group that's out there that lives for God, friend. But you get down to the point where you're worshiping them, if point of grace means more to you than Jesus Christ, you need to chunk those CDs for a while and go after God. Pick up your Bible and follow him. According to the word of God, once you've earned a crown, once you've got it, now let me tell you how you earn a crown. You earn a crown by living for Jesus. You earn a crown by doing stuff for Jesus. Your crown represents what you did in this life. It's going to get real heavy in a few minutes. Real heavy, and then we're going to close. So stay with me. But your crown represents what you did in this life. Be it short or long, it doesn't matter. See, I work the way I work because one day my life is going to be over, but it's not over. When it's over, I'm in eternity, and I'm standing before the creator of the universe, and I will be held accountable for what I did down here. You're going to be held accountable for what you did with this Pearl of Great Price convention. You're going to be held accountable for what you did during this conference. Did you follow God? Did you listen to God? Those of you up in the upper bleachers, did you go after him? Did you come here and goof off? Or did you worship God? What did you do with this awesome, awesome, awesome conference this week? Did you come to get entertained? Or did you come to bend your knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and get close to him? Why did you come to this conference? One of the exciting things about our ministry right now that I, that I love is because we've gone for so long at Brownsville, people know our ministry, and they know when they invite us what they're going to get. And so I got a call from the General Council of the Assemblies of God the other day and asked me to speak at the General Council, not only the General Council, but also the Youth Congress at the General Council. And the beauty of that is, to speak to just seven, 8,000 teenagers there in Orlando, is this. I said, well, what's your theme? What's the theme for the night? He said, Steve, you know us better than that. We have a theme, but you can do anything you want. You're free to preach the way you want to preach. I asked the general council at the, the, at the general council on Friday night, coming up in Orlando in August. I asked, I asked the leadership. That the place holds 20,000 people. And I said, what do you want me to speak on? They said, no, 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 no. We're going to turn it over to you, and the whole thing's yours. 
After that, want to know why, friend? They know they're going to hear an uncompromised gospel. And God honors that. He kisses it. And that's what keeps me going, friend. The opportunity to share the gospel. The thousands of people that are coming to Jesus. And if you get saved right, you'll live right. If you get the sin out tonight, if you get the sin out of your life, some of you say you love Jesus, but the stuff you're watching at home. If we walked into your house and grabbed a video out of the video cabinet and slapped it on Sunday morning in the video deck and put it on the screen in front of the whole church with your name underneath it, what would happen to you? Would you crawl out of church? Would you belly crawl out of that place and out of embarrassment because some nudity scene, cussing, God cussing is, is going on, on on that screen because somebody went into your private stash? What do you have, a Jesus at home and a Jesus at church? Are there two Jesuses in your life? Is there one that lets you get away with stuff? And when you go to church, you're going, holy, holy, holy. You're holy at church and you're a heathen at home? It don't work like that, friend. I'm talking about your crown. Well, according to the word of God, once you've earned a crown, it can be stolen from you. Say, it can be stolen from me. The devil can steal it from, from you. I want you to think about this, friend, just for a minute. We're closing in just a few minutes. The devil can steal it from you. The Bible said that the devil, Jesus came up to, uh, to Peter and said, Peter, in Luke 22, 31, 32, Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. The devil went after Peter. You know what the devil wanted? The devil wanted Peter's crown. He wanted that reward. Whatever Peter was going to be in life, the devil wanted to snuff it out. And if you're climbing right now, you're going after God, God's using you. Trust me, friend, the devil is right at your heels. He wants your crown. He doesn't want you to stand before God and be rewarded. He wants you to stand before God and be thrown into the pits of hell. So he's after you. He will do anything he can to stop you from getting your reward. He went after Jesus' crown. The devil took Jesus up on a high mountain, and he said, Jesus, all this I will give to you if you'll bow down and worship me. I hope you're listening, friend. The devil can steal it from you. He went after Judas' crown. The Bible says in John chapter 13, after supper ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. The devil went after Judas' crown and won. Some of you in this room, I'll tell you how the devil's stolen your crown. You were going to go into the ministry, but now you got a little job going on. You're making a little moolah. I've met people that own car lots, they started by buying one car at an auction. They had a few hundred bucks. They went down and bought a clunker, took it back, cleaned up the motor a little bit, changed the oil, shined it up, simonized it, cleaned it up, and put it, put it down in the front yard and made 200 bucks profit. They went, wow, I like that. That was quick, easy work. So they go down and buy another car, make a little bit more money. Then they go buy two cars, and they make a little bit more money. Next news, you know, they got two and three and four cars sitting out in front of their house. How many have seen things like this? You seen these automobiles out there? Let me tell you what some of these folks are. They were people. Some of these people were called of God. When they were teenagers, God called them into the ministry. When they were young, God called them at, at some camp or some conference in Pensacola. But now they're making a few bucks and they're saying, God, as soon as I get a little bit of money, I'll follow you. I'll be able to pay my way to the mission field, God. When I get a little bit of money, I'll be able to make it in life. Listen up at home. You better hear me, because some of you are at home, the reason you're at home and not in church, the reason you don't listen to God anymore is because you've fallen away and you know you've fallen away. The devil's come, he's offered you a bill of goods. He said, just do this. God's in it, God's in it. There are people that have been blessed financially that God didn't have a thing to do with. The devil can steal your crown. He'll offer you all kinds of stuff, friend. He'll come up to you and offer you a girlfriend. He'll offer you a boyfriend. He'll say, I know you love God. Here, this guy will help you serve God. This girl will help you serve God. Next news you know, you're in the back seat of a car with the windows steamed up and you've lost out on God. But you were going to be a missionary. You were going to be something for God. Oh, I can feel his presence in this place. Who we? Boy, have I skipped some notes tonight. The devil can steal it from you, friend. 
I'll tell you something else that can happen. You can give it up. You can freely give it up. You can freely give up your crown out of jealousy, envy, covetousness. Some of you. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 4.10, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. You know what he did? In? He traded in his crown. He was traveling with Paul the Apostle. He was important in the kingdom of God, but he probably went through Thessalonica or some city and had a business opportunity and sold out to the devil. He made up his own mind. Demas, the Bible doesn't say the devil took Demas and, and took him out of the, the ministry. The Bible says Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. I'm warning everyone here, friend. The crown. Charlie, I want you to bring me that first one there. Here's what I'm afraid of for many of you in this room and many of you at home. Mike, go ahead. See this? It's worthless. It's a paper crown. You know what it stands for? A life of selfishness. A life of conceit. A life of covetousness. Me. Myself. And I. Me and my girlfriend. Me and my boyfriend. Oh, you're all right. You were on the drama team at church. You would do a few things, but you weren't that committed. You were religious. Religion is hanging around the cross, friend. Christianity is getting on the cross. I warn everyone here tonight and everyone at home, you can go to hell with baptismal waters dripping from your face. You can go to hell with a communion cup in your hand and a wafer in your mouth. You can go to hell with a promise keeper's shirt on. You can go to hell with a yes, Lord, we will ride with you bumper sticker on the back of your car. But on the day you stand before Jesus, what is he going to have in his hands? I don't know about you, friend. I don't want the Lord to be holding in his hand a paper crown. Worthless! This is what I did with my life. You spoke to me about sin, but I just couldn't give up smoking. You spoke to me about pornography, but I just couldn't give up masturbation. You spoke to me about adultery, but I just couldn't give up my lover. You spoke to me about this, but I just couldn't do it. You spoke to me about ministry, but God, I was more enthralled with my business. I had to make money. I was moving up. I was a manager of McDonald's, and one day I was going to own my own franchise. I was moving up, God worthless worthless and as that mighty host is standing around and the Lord comes up friend this ain't gonna happen to me and you better pray it doesn't happen to you that you kneel before God and the Lord receives from an angel this cardboard paper crown and takes it you will be so a shame. At the end of every life, there is reward or punishment. We will be judged for our works. We will be judged for our words. And we will be judged for our walk. Your words. Your walk. You'll be judged for everything you did on the face of this earth. Every idle word that came from your mouth, you'll be judged. Friend, right now, in some manufacturing house in heaven, somebody's thinking about your crown. What are they thinking? I want to tell you what I want. On that final day,
on that final day, I want there to be a hush in heaven. And I want to stand before my Jesus. You know, Cassie did this just a little while ago. She went from the library to the throne room. Rachel went from the library to the throne room. They knelt before the Lord. <sighs> when this day happens for me, I don't know about you, but I know what I want. I want the most incredible, the most spectacular, the most glorious crown that was ever created in heaven. I want platinum, I want gold, I want silver. I want precious stones and diamonds and rubies and emeralds. I want the angels to begin working on it and working on it and working on it and I want them to discuss among themselves, who is this for? And on that day when I stand before the Lord, I don't know about you, friend, See, the Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own. I can't take you to heaven. You're going to have to make it on your own. And you're going to have to stand before God on your own. Here's what I want, friend. When I stand before God, I want a crown to be brought out from the throne room from some warehouse. And I want the angels to go, oh, oh, look at that thing. Look at that. Who's that for? It's that boy over there. That young man. Who is he? They say he was an evangelist. Let's get closer and listen to what Jesus says. And I want to be kneeling. And I want the Lord to stand before me with the crown. And say, Steve, proud of you, boy. Son, when things got rough, you kept going. When they criticized you, you kept on moving. When they made fun of you, you kept on going. Oh, you didn't shed any blood, Steve. That's okay. I didn't call you to shed blood. I called you to preach. I called you to preach, and you would have shed blood, Steve. And I want the Lord to take the crown, and I want him to bring it towards my head. And as he's doing that, I'm going to grab it, and I'm going to push it off. And the Lord's going to push it back on, and I'm going to push it back off. The Lord's going to push it back on, and I'm going to go, Jesus, forgive me, Lord. But this is one battle you're not going to win because this crown represents my life on earth. You saved me when I was a mean, bad drug addict. I was nothing, Jesus. All my earthly belongings fit into a paper sack when you saved me, Jesus. I'll never forget that day, Jesus. And you know, I decided on October 28, 1975 that I was going to serve you all the days of my life. And Jesus, I've done that. We've been through some tough times together, Lord. But you've brought me through them all. And by your grace, I've been used of you. It's all you, Jesus, but I've seen hundreds of thousands of people get right with God. Maybe millions, I don't know, Jesus. But from the look of these rubies and these diamonds and these emeralds, you've taken notice, Jesus. And I'm thankful for that because now I have something in my hands to throw back at your feet. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, Jesus, worthy is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. I give it to you, Jesus, I give it to you, Jesus, I give it to you, Jesus, I give it to you, Jesus. Jesus. See, that's what I want to happen for me, friend. I've got a friend in Argentina. 
He's a five gold medalist. You may not know one of those, but I know one personally. He's won five gold medals at the Pan American Games in Indianapolis. He's an Argentine hero. His name is Jose Luis Luzano. He's a hero in Argentina. He's a speed skater. Those of you that love to skate, this guy is as fast as lightning. Won five gold medals. He took the Pan American Games by storm. He was on every major channel in America. When he got back to Argentina, he came back to a hero's welcome. Parades, his name was on every radio station. And I went into his house in a town called Nail Ken, Argentina. I could not wait to hug his neck and to say that I knew Jose Luis. When I walked into his house, I did just that. I hugged his neck and I looked around the house. I looked everywhere for the medals. Up on the wall was a picture of him and a major newspaper story in the United States. Other major articles from Argentina, major newspapers. But I was looking around for the medals. And I said, Jose Luis, I just want to touch a gold medal. Where are they? Oh, he said, Brother Steve, I'm sorry, I don't have any. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I gave them all away. I said, you gave away your gold medals? He said, yeah, to the people that are important to me, Steve. He said this, Steve, I gave one to my mother because if it wasn't for mom and her encouragement, I would have never been a speed skater. Steve, I gave one to my little brother because he's always looked up to me and I've always been the hero in the family and he deserved a medal more than I did. Steve, I gave one to my coach who always believed in me, never gave up on me when I fell down. He said, get up, Jose. You can be the fastest skater in the world. Get up and skate. I gave one medal to him. I said, well, there's two more, Jose. And he said, well, I gave one to a friend of mine who's got leukemia that'll never be able to skate. He's in a wheelchair. I put one around his neck. He prayed for me. And I gave one to my church because they interceded for me while I was at the Pan American Games. And if it wasn't for them, I would have never won. Oh, the lesson I learned, friend. Everything that he earned, all the work, all the labor, it mounted up. And finally, at the pinnacle, the star, the final reward, they lock these things over his neck, just keep draping him with these gold medals. And he can't wait to get back to Argentina to give them all away. I cannot wait to get to heaven to give it all away. You can't have my crown. Devil, you can't have it. I said, devil, you can't have it. Jesus. It's all for him. I want the house lights up a little bit right now. But the house lights up just a little bit. I want to see your eyes. I want to see your faces. I want you to hear me tonight, friend. It may be difficult you to, for, for you to think about tomorrow. But there's, a, there's a, uh, an event called the rapture. How many have heard of the rapture? From the sound of that, some of you, are, you're not ready for it. The rapture could take place tonight. Coronation day is going to be next. Judgment day is going to be next. You better start building this thing, friend. Paul said, there is laid up for me a crown. There is laid up for me a crown. Jesus said, don't anyone 
take your crown. Don't let anyone steal it. Eric and Dylan tried to steal Cassie's. Yes! I believe. Don't let anybody steal your crown. Don't let anybody take it. Some of you, a little bit of criticism comes along and you wilt. Like a flower in the hot sun. You just wilt. A little bit of criticism. Why don't you stand up and be a man of God? Stand up and be a woman of God. Take a little heat at school. Goodness, friend. Take a little heat. You know what I'm sick of? I'm sick of rock stars that make it go through three or four years of all kinds of I mean they're blasted by the media because they're, they're failures then they rise again and they're heroes again then they fall again then they rise again falling rise fall you see them all the time they come and go like the wind you know what they do they don't listen to the criticism they don't listen you know what they do they go back to their they go back to their homes I'm talking about secular people they go back to their homes and they write songs they don't care what the critics say they write songs. same with movie producers they'll produce a movie it'll be phenomenal Another movie will be a total flop, and they're the, the laughing stock of Hollywood. But you know what they do? They go back to their studio, and they, they think, and they look at scripts, and they think of stories. And next news you know, they got a blockbuster hit in the nation. I'm talking about the sector. Suddenly, they're on top. Boy, Christians. Christians, boy, they go to the first couple days of school. They're ashamed to show their Bible. Shame somebody's not going to like them. I want to tell you how to be liked. You be liked by Jesus. You be liked by Jesus. That's all that matters on the face of this globe. I want everyone to stand. Mike, I want your team to come up here. We're going to sing the song, Lord Have Mercy. I'm serious about this, friends. See, I could die tonight. This could be my last message. Be fine with me if it was. I live what I'm preaching. I said I live what I'm preaching. One of the reasons the secular media from 2020, CNN, The Today Show, Good Morning America, Spin Magazine, one of the reasons all of these major media people treat us with respect is because they see we're not plastic. I will sit in front of the major media. I don't care who it is. It could be Barbara Walters. It doesn't matter. And we'll speak straight to them. I was at the AP wire service last week, and the man looked into my face, and he said this. You might be here tonight, sir. He looked into my face, and I said, sir, let me ask you something. I know you're here as a media project for the world, and AP is going to go all over the world. I want to ask you a question. Do you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? And he said, I make it a point not to discuss politics, or religion during my interviews and I said sir Jesus loves you and has a plan for your life one of the reasons the media has treated us with respect friend is because we haven't bellied up when they come around because I know when you speak like that to the media they can rip you to shreds they can get this wild idea and just just rip you to shreds but I'm talking to major media have not done that because we've spoken straight in their eyes and they respect that and as a Christian when you get back into school next month or month after probably next month for most of them when you get back into school that's a spooky thought isn't it when you get when you get back into school you look your friend lift your head up high you look your friends in the face and you're not going to be a Christian for a week or two weeks. You're going to be a Christian for the entire school year, all the way through. All the way through. All the way through. On fire when you went in, on fire when you went out. All the way through the school year. Hallelujah. 
Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give an altar call. Those of you in this room that need forgiveness, I don't want anyone to step out yet. I want you to hear me. You're backslidden. You need Jesus Christ to touch your life. You know it. You're backslidden. You need Jesus Christ to touch your life. Maybe you got right with God Tuesday night. Maybe last night God spoke to you through Jeannie. Maybe tonight you're dealing with something different. I don't know. But friend, when there's something in your heart pricking you, deal with it. Deal with it. Don't play games with God. You're not going to recreate this atmosphere. This is, this is a Holy Ghost atmosphere. And you're not going to get right with God at the day's end. You're not going to get right with God at the Hampton, at the residence. You're going to get right with God here. Right here. This is where you're going to get right with God. Those of you that are backslidden, in just a minute, Mike's going to sing, Lord, have mercy. You're going to come forward, those that are backslidden. Those in, that, that means that you were once on fire for God, but you drifted. You have drifted. Those of you in this room that have never known the Lord, listen up top. You've never known God. Maybe somebody drug you in here tonight. I don't know, but you've never known God. You can meet Jesus tonight. We've sung about him. We've preached about him. I'm going to go meet him in just a short while. I'm going to be standing before God Almighty. I'm going to stand before the King of Kings. Do you know him? That's why so many thousands call that TV broadcast. Because I went right into America's home and I asked him the question, do you know Jesus? Do you know him? People started squalling and bawling. Charlie just told me about a young man whose heart is rock, who got up from the living room. This man's on drugs, isn't he? Just a messed up guy. He got up from his living room and, and ran into his bedroom and just shut the door. 45 minutes later, he comes out and his mom says, you want me to pray with you? That, that you know, you want me to pray a prayer of repentance? He said, I've already done that. He said, I'm right with Jesus now. I'm right with Jesus. Get right. Get right with the Lord tonight. Those of you that have never known the Lord, you can meet him tonight. And those of you in this room that are religious, man, I tell you what, if we could get this stale, crusty religion off of us. What drove me nuts about youth ministry, what drove me nuts was this. I hated that. Up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. One day they're saved. You wouldn't know what kind of mood she was going to be in. She'd come to the youth meeting. He'd come to the youth meeting. You're wondering if she's saved this week. Last week she was saved. But this week what happened? Good day, bad day. What's going on with her? You know what? You look for the signs. You get tired of that, friend. You get tired of that. You want soldiers. I said soldiers that are going to be living for God today, living for God tomorrow, living for God two days from now, three days from now. They're going to live for God day in and day out. People you can depend on. Where religion is hanging around the cross and you can be part of the greatest youth group in town, friend, and be unsaved. And your youth leader can't save you, friend. It's youth conference can't save you. Your neighbor can't save you. Your best friend can't save you. You're going to have to get on your face before God by yourself. Well, what are you talking about, Steve? Let me tell you, friend, I'm a father. I've got three kids, 11, 8, and 4. My 8-year-old and my 11-year-old, they know now that if they can go to hell by themselves. I've told them both. Ryan is 11. He's past the age of accountability. Shelby's 8. She's past the age of accountability. Kelsey's 4. She's still too young, but she's learning about the cross. But these other kids, they know if they want to go to hell, they can go to hell on their own. And Daddy can't take them to heaven. They're going to have to repent, go after God on their own. That's spooky. It's scary. My older son, Ryan, he said, Daddy, are you serious about this? And I said, yes, yeah, son. You're the son of the evangelist, but I can't save you. I'm going to heaven. Mommy's going to heaven, but you're going to have to make it on your own. Religion won't save you. Being the son of the Brownsville evangelist won't save you. That's right. Friend, being at this conference won't save you. You're going to have to make a commitment on your own. Amen. Listen up in the bleachers. On your own. There's a large crowd here tonight. This is phenomenal. But friend, I want to tell you, God doesn't save people corporately. It's one away. Ain't no buddy system. Me and Sheila, we're getting right. No, you're getting right. Sheila's getting right, okay? One at a time. God doesn't say, here they both come. No. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you. One at a time, friend. Here's what we're going to do tonight. I'm going to give this altar call. Those of you that need to get right with God, some of you, 
have missed God. You're doing things God called you into the ministry and you've missed God. You're doing other things and you know God's called you. Friend, you're trading in that precious crown for some paper piece of junk. You're going to be embarrassed on that final day. Oh, you're going to make it in. You're going to make it in. But friend, how many have heard of the marriage supper of the Lamb? That's, a, that's not a fairy tale. I'm going to be there. Richard's going to be there. Charlie's going to be there. Donnie, we're going to be there. We're going to be at the marriage supper, Mike. When I'm at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and I sit across from a martyr, I want to have something to say. Amen. When you're at the marriage supper of the Lamb, when you're standing before, when you're sitting at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and someone across the table says to you, well, where are you from? Pennsylvania. Hello. And then they ask you that question. Then you say, where are you from? And she says, Rome. And they say, you say, what about you? And this girl says, well, I died during Nero's. When he, when he martyred, martyred all the Christians. I, I died at the uh, mouth of the lions. She just shares that with you. Then, then she says, tell me about your life. And you didn't do one thing for God. Nothing. You could barely stay saved. But boy, you slipped in. You made it in. Friend, I want to walk the streets of gold with my head up. And it's not proud. It's not pride. It said I did something with this flesh and blood. My life, I did something for Jesus. And when I walk up to the Apostle Paul and Elijah and the rest of them, I want to go, Hey, Eli, how's it going, brother? Paul, what's happening today? Richard, what about that conference down there in Pensacola? That's what Moses is going to say to him. You know what Moses is going to say? Moses is going to say, you know, I had all them special effects way before electricity. <laughs> <laughs> those of you that need to get right with God as Mike leads us in Lord have mercy I want you to step from your seat and get up here and get on your knees right now start singing Mike I want you to come right now you need to get right with God come on right now and kneel 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 come on all the way, move all the way forward as much as you can. Okay, you got yeah, that line. That's fine.
Now we're going to close this in about 60 seconds. We're going to close the altar call. If you're coming, friend, and I want everyone to do this something right now because I, I don't want anyone to leave this room without being right with God tonight. Everyone in this room that's not at the altar, those of you at the altar, keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Keep going after God. That's music in God's ears. The weeping, the brokenness is music. Jesus understands that. That's incense, sweet incense in the nostrils of God. That's music in the ears of God. We're going to give you 60 seconds to come if you're coming. I want everyone else to turn to the person next to them. You're going to ask them this question. Do you need Jesus Christ to forgive you? If someone turns to you and asks you that question, do you need Jesus Christ to forgive you, don't lie. Now we're out of room. There's a little bit of space on the far right and left-hand side, but the rest of the way we're out of room. But if someone turns to you and asks you that question, do you need Jesus Christ to forgive you, don't lie. If you need forgiveness, I want both of you to come down together. I want both of you to come down together and find a place to kneel in this place. Find it. You've got to come and kneel. You've got to come and kneel. It's an act of contrition. It's an act of brokenness. And God honors it. Don't let pride hold you back. One more time, Mike. If you're coming, come now. to him. Talk to him. Talk to him. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to wash you. Ask him to make your life count. Make it count, Jesus. Make it count. I want everyone at the altar to pray this prayer out loud with me right now. Those of you at home, I want you to pray this prayer right now. Everyone out loud that's at this altar. Dear Jesus, no, pray it again. Pray it out loud. Don't mumble. Dear Jesus, thank you for speaking to me. Thank you, Jesus, for not leaving me alone. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence in this Colosseum. I ask you tonight to forgive me. I have sinned. I have hurt you. I have hurt others. And I have hurt myself. Forgive me, Jesus. Wash me, Jesus. Cleanse me, Jesus. Make me new. I repent. Lord Jesus, be my Savior. Be my Lord and my very best friend. From this moment on, I am yours and you are mine. Jesus, come live your life through me. I give myself, I give myself to, you. to you. And Jesus, Jesus I, will not I will not let anyone, let anyone take, my take my crown. They can't have it. Glory!
you to stand and face this way. Richard's going to come and share a few things with you. I want you to stand and face this way, Charlie. Get on this. Stand and face this way.